Hello, welcome to the Oral History of Criminology Project. We're here today in Atlanta at the meeting of the American Society of Criminology on November 15, 2018. My name is Helen Eigenberg, and I'm here to interview Joanna Belknap. And we're going to talk about her life and distinguished career in criminology and criminal justice. So, to begin with, can you just give us the short and condensed and super impressive version of your vita, um, because you know it way better than me. Um, so academically, I, um, I'm a Colorado native, and I graduated from University of Colorado Boulder in um, 1981. And then I started my master's in criminal justice at Michigan State, and then um, finished my PhD in criminal justice, also at Michigan State in 1986. And then um, I was a, went from there to be a professor in criminal justice with an affiliation of women, what was then women's studies, um, at University of Cincinnati. I was there 12 years. And then um, I always say I would have been voted by my friends back in my undergraduate, to least likely to ever be a professor here or anywhere else. But then I went back as a professor in 1998, um, and I had a, I called it, um, I was by. I had a joint appointment in sociology and women's studies there, um, and then through a bunch of different things that happened for the last three years, I have been um, a professor of ethnic studies, which has been a great fit. I should. I love. I love where I am now. It's just. Been, it's been really great. So that's kind of where I am with academically. Right. That's your path to where you've been and how you've gotten there. Mm -hmm. What about your path in terms of like? a summary of some of your administrative work. Um, okay, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Like, um, the chair of the department. Oh, okay. Okay, so I've only been... Any, any different administrative position? Okay, I didn't have. have much. I mean, I've been graduate chair and undergraduate chair at different times of my life, and I'm undergraduate chair and associate chair of ethnic studies now. Um, but I was only chair for a year, and that was a hot mess. But, so, should I talk about that now or later? <laughs> Let's do that later. Okay. Let's so up. yeah, I was only chair for a year, so yeah. Um, administration's not my thing. Teaching and research, and, or yeah, Definitely. teaching and research service are my things, but not administration. Okay. So having said that, then can you talk to us a little bit about um, your teaching, research, and service in terms of like I've never seen anybody had to divide their awards into kinds. <laughs> um, no, it's so impressive. So like the different awards and. Like what you've taught over the years, your main classes, the ones that are your favorite, so on. Okay. Um, so, so I, um, I, I did feel really proud of my awards, and, and I, I'm really, in some ways, more proud of my teaching and service awards, especially from the community, the service awards, because I have been very invested in, in community and activism my entire life, and. It just and it feels like it's. I've always felt like it's made me a better professor. So, um, so some of my awards have been um, one. One of the more recent ones I got was Women Who Like the Community in Boulder, and that was for my work with the jail reentry program in Boulder County, um, volunteer work there. Um, and I, I've gotten I got an award from um, the Domestic Violence Coordinating Council in Denver a number of years ago for my work advocating for um, victims and trying to make change. And, um, and um, I've gotten a lot of teaching awards, though. I, the ones, I, I don't know, it just, I, it just it, they all feel great. I just feel... And most of them are teaching and mentoring. Yeah, and then mentoring, too. And I, um, I, one of the things I feel the proudest of with is what I've done with honor students, as I always say, I feel like most people, for some departments, um, if once you get to a PhD program, you're probably going to be fine. But to get there from undergraduate, so I just I feel really proud of all the honor students I've had, and that and how many of them have been first generation students and students of color, and that have gone on to and, and it's not you know, necessarily because of me, but I do feel like I helped make the honors happen, which is a huge you know I feel like the huge. single best thing that most students can acquire. You know, most of them think that we were born and headed to a PhD. Yeah. Program. And it's like, I think what you do is so great to let them see they could do this and that you never knew you were going to do this. Yeah, and, and, I, and I didn't even know honors existed 
um, I would always tell my students I didn't know, and I, I, I used to tell them at the beginning it wasn't here when I was an undergrad, and then I found out it was. <laughs> oh well. Bad um, mentoring. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I just I really feel pleased with that. I feel really proud of the classes I've implemented um, at University of Colorado. I made the, a number of new classes. One was Violence Against Women and Girls, which is very very popular. I could teach it every semester and have it fill with a hundred plus students. Um, and then race, class, gender, and crime. Um, I started both of those at University of Colorado and they were both cross-listed in women's studies and sociology. And then, um, and then when I um, got moved to, when I moved to ethnic studies, we cross-listed them there. Then a couple of years ago, I implemented a social justice, intro to social justice class. It's an ethnic studies class. So I taught it for the first time on campus a year ago and had 70 students and I have 140 this semester. And so that's awesome, and I feel like uh, I, I really love doing the social justice part of um, the of criminal justice. Just and, um, so that's been really fun and really exciting. And then I am the first person at the University of Colorado to implement an inside-out prison exchange program. So I took Temple University's wonderful training, the inside-out prison exchange program training, um, a few summers ago, and then um, I implemented it. And what was the program for people who don't know? Oh, oh sorry, yes. So it's um, um, people, it's a wonderful program where you merge undergraduate students, the outside students, with prisoners, the inside students, all in the same college class. And you sit in a circle and have this college class together in the prison um, it's, um, for three hours every week. And um, so that one I did social justice as well, um, but did it a little bit differently. Um, but anyway, so in the prison. So, implementing that and that was, I just felt like that was kind of a pinnacle of my career in a lot of ways because I just feel like I've done research in prison, I write about prisons, I've done the advocacy stuff for reentry yeah, teaching. and teaching and then to be able to teach prisoners and um, it, it, I mean, and then I've also been really proud of myself that I raised the money that pays for the tuition for the students too because a lot of the inside out, the inside students don't actually get college credit because nobody can pay for it so I have been able to do that. Wow. Yeah, so that's I didn't know that. yeah, that's thanks. So that's been really exciting, um, and it's just um, you know, and I, I always say I feel like the main thing people get out of this is everybody is so surprised how smart the prison, the inside students are. And oh, the grace. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, um, just because it's my favorite named award. Will you explain what the Inconvenient Woman Award is? Yeah. So, um, so I was the first recipient of the Inconvenient Woman of the Year Award. You are also a recipient of it, um, and it was I was it was the Division of Women in Crime, um, the American Society of Criminology, and um, and it was after I had been standing up for I was the only employee of the University of Colorado that was standing up against how the administration had been sweeping all of these rape charges under the rug and trying to hide it. And with the football team. With the football team. And, um, and so it was the, the football coach, Gary Barnett, and the athletic director, and the ch president and the chancellor of the university had been, like, just been hiding it, had all these reports about it, and weren't doing anything. And so I, I, I ended up getting this unbelievable amount of press because I was the only employee that was saying they should be fired. Um, that was kind of weird because it was one of those things, like, I just thought most people would be like, yeah, they should, this is terrible. And then I uh, ended up getting all this threatening and hate mail. I, I had no idea how big football fans could get involved. Well, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so then I, um, so I got the Inconvenient Woman of the Year Award for that, which has been a great award that we give with uh, Division of Women. I think that's the only time you've been inconvenient. No, it's not the only time I've been inconvenient. <laughs> I was born quite sure of that. Yeah. And your most recent oh. award? Oh, the fellow, the fellow of last night. Oh, yeah. I became a fellow of the American Society of Criminology, and so, and I like that it's a combination of, of research and mentoring, and so that made me really happy too. And um, I, I, one of the things that they wrote in the letter, which I feel, I'm really, I'm really pleased with how many of my students I have published with, but I'm also really pleased with how many of my publications are with practitioners, that it's been practitioner-informed right. research and that they are getting the credit that they deserve as co-authors, and I don't, I don't think we do that enough. And can you give us a, I know this is going to be really hard, but a summary of your um, works in areas of concentration within 
research as well. Yeah. I, one, of, one of the things I love about this job is just that he, how you can just kind of get interested in something new, and even though it's always been criminology, I just, oh, wow, this would be interesting. And a lot of times it's because of volunteer work I'm doing. But I started out um, wanting to study, um, I, the first time I got interested in criminology, I was, um, I, it was my junior year and I dropped out the year before that because I didn't want to be a physical therapist and um, I didn't get into physical therapy school based on the psychometric test and they said I had the second to worst personality of all of the people who had applied to get in and I was devastated so I dropped out for a year and reapplied and apparently still had that same um, person now? Yeah. <laughs> so um, my mother said I was probably that I don't take orders well so I don't know. Anyway, I it was, it was, I had wanted to be a physical therapist since eighth grade. I worked and volunteered Easter Seals, all these nursing homes, taught cross-country skiing to people who were blind and done just like so much stuff and it was like, oh God, now what am I going to do? And so I dropped out and then I came back and thought, okay, I'll, maybe I'll think about law school. And so I was majoring in political science and by then a bunch of my friends were lawyers and were like, oh my God, you would hate law school so much, it's so uncreative, you'll hate the precedence mm -hmm. thing. You'll, and I was like, oh my God, I really, briefs. really, the terrible, yeah, briefs, like you will, they're like, this is not for you. And so I was taking a political science class on urban public policy and that would have been about 19, um, probably 79 or 80, 80 in the spring. And, um, and when they, there was one week on prisons and I just, it was just like, I don't know what happened, but I just was like, oh my God, this is terrible. And I didn't have a car at the time, and I cannot figure out how I did this now, but it was 1980. Um, but I, somehow I took a bus to a prisoner jail, and, um, and it was a men's, and I, the thing that was most shocking to me was how many Native American men there were in, like I was just shocked that, so uh, yeah, yeah brown, so many brown people, and I thought, I don't think I have ever seen this many Native American people in one place in my life. And I just became obsessed with prisons being a mess, and so I talked to the teacher, that class, the professor, and he said, well, get a master's in criminal justice. So I had no idea what I was doing, and this was before the internet and all that stuff. So I applied to um, two places. One was Michigan State, and the other place, um, and it ends up was not doing the program way before the internet. So, and then I was doing study abroad in England that year. But um, so I ended up getting in. So that was great. But also realized that um, I was not going to be able to do much in the way of prison reform with a master's in criminal justice. So, um, and then thought, okay, I need to get it. And then Mary Moresh, she was the first uh, woman in a tenure track position there, and she had started the year before me. I'm pretty sure it was the year before me, it might have been two years before, but anyway, so I was her first master's student and then I was her first PhD student. And she was an amazing mentor and um, she, I, I think most people, it was sexism that people didn't want her on their committees, but it was also, she was really smart. She was an unbelievable um, writer and grammarian and, and statistician, but it was great for me. I felt like I had all of her attention <laughs> for <laughs> And she got my, my chapters back to me right away and gave great, um, statistical advice and all that sort of That's thing. You were a full-time job. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So that worked out very well for me, and um, and so I did my dissertation on econ looking at economic, uh, very statistical, because we did, actually didn't get trained in anything qualitative, but looking at statistical um, how crime, crime rates and incarceration rates and race and class and gender and um, and sadly I never published anything but the lit review I and I looking back on it I just I, I think I should have sent it to criminal or to economics journals because I was that's who I was quoting a lot and I was doing econometric modeling but I didn't I, I just I didn't at that point I just didn't know what to do after I kept getting rejected but I started this new project in um, because I ended up right after I got to Cincinnati in 1986 being on the board for the um, the women's shelter and um, um, the domestic violence shelter. And, um, and then they were like, we need to do a, um, and it was for all of Cincinnati and the YWCA ran it and they said, well, we need to do a survey of police officers. So I, I mean, I just feel like I fell into this thing of being able to put together this and having the police department support because it was something on there. So I had this 10 page survey. I'm trying to remember now, I think I had over 400, might have been as many as 500 police officers. Mm -hmm that completed it and I was going to um, 
to different districts, giving it out at all the different shifts. And um, but I was able to get tenure off of those public off of that. I had gotten the contract to write my book, The Invisible Woman. They'd actually asked, and it was Brooks Cole, I think, was the publisher that actually, they kept changing. And they'd actually asked Mary Morris to do it my, my last year, my doctorate. And she said, I don't have time, but you should ask this graduate student. So I wrote the proposal and got it. My first reviews of it were, um, as we found out later, you were one of the reviewers, but two of them were really negative. Of the yeah, first few years was not. I said, this is my lecture notes. <laughs> I'll look at it now. <laughs> and, um, some, of, some of them said things. One of my favorites was, she acts like women who kill their husbands in self-defense should be given an award. <laughs> anyway, I got, concept. I got a, I know. Hmm. Um, so I got a little discouraged with the negative ones, and I also they were slower than molasses. So I thought, okay, I'm not, this book is not going to be out, out in time for ten years, so I just need to publish all this other stuff. So that's what I did. Um, just publish the other stuff, but then so then it was getting into violence against women, and. Um, which I had had an interest in that anyway, and I was teaching um, this course analysis of sexual assault that Marty Schwartz had started at the University of Cincinnati before I was there, and I just loved teaching that class. It was a 10-week, they were on quarters. And then I taught race, class, and crime, and then I taught women in crime there, so I had all that. Okay, so then, um, I and, and in the interim of when I had applied for getting, going to, um, or, or thinking about that I wanted to do this whole, um, get a master's in criminal justice. I, that summer, um, and it was before I applied, right before I was applying for graduate school, I was coming back from, I was cleaning out my locker because um, I was going to be studying abroad the next year, and it was a summer afternoon, and I think it was only like three o'clock in the afternoon, and I was walking back from the rec center, and I had my dad's old wooden tennis racket, and, and it was bright out, beautiful summer day, and I was the only one on campus, and I was just kind of thinking, walking along, and I had my wallet in one hand and my dad's tenant or strike in the other hand, and I didn't hear somebody come up behind me, and they, I had long hair then, as I do again now, um, and pulled my braid, which I was kind of used to people doing then, and it ends up, it was a man who was trying to rape me. So um, I froze. And he had me on the ground, and all of a sudden I thought, oh my god, I have this tennis racket. So I just started wailing on him with a tennis racket, and he got up and left. And it was, it was definitely one of those pivotal times in life of changing everything. I walked back. I lived near campus. My child was living with my, child, my childhood friend who was going to see you that summer. And I was crying all the way back. I felt, like, really upset. And when I got back, she's like, oh my god, what happened to you? And she said, I didn't realize my face, like, I was kind of beat up. Not all bad, but um, anyway, so I told her what happened, and neither of us had a car, and we just got in, we just got on the bus and went to her parents in Denver, and, um, and, and the, what happened here was, it, um, it, because of this, I unrepressed memories about being sexually abused as a child. Like, I don't know if it ever would have happened or when it would have happened, but that, all of a sudden, I just started having these nightmares about being sexually abused as a child. And, and I started thinking, oh my God, this is true. And this was in 1981, when the sociology textbooks were saying things like incest happens in one in a million families and stuff like that. And I just, um, I, I, so I go off to study in England, but I'm a hot mess. and. Um, I was really an angry person, and I was really depressed, and um, and I told a few people there that, um, I told one person there that what I was afraid had happened to me, and um, and she was really, really supportive and really bummed out. I lost touch with her. She was um, a temporary law school faculty. And I came back and was really, really depressed and suicidal, And but I'd gotten into this master's program so I was excited about that, but I started um, seeing a therapist for the first time. And that's when I just realized, oh my god, I think this is true. And, um, and so, so I go off to graduate school, and so a lot of my first years of graduate school were being in a really intensive therapy around this. And really, you know, like I didn't want to kill myself, but I was afraid it was going to kill me. I like just because everything felt really horrible. And, and yet, school was this thing that made me feel better. 
and about myself. It was where I could excel. And so I kind of thought at some point I want to do this work with violence, you know, gender-based abuse, violence against women and girls and all that sort of thing too. And so it was cool to be able to then get to Cincinnati, teach all of this, and then ultimately do what I was, had been interested in a long time of had been what we now call pathways theories, um, you know, starting some of the re early research on that, of looking at how does childhood trauma put people at risk for either youthful or adult offending. And I feel like one of the big, my big contributions was insisting on having boys in the study that, mm -hmm. um, that on the pathway. So Christy Holsinger and I, they didn't want to, they, they, we had this money from OJJDP that had been given to Ohio, and they didn't want us to include boys in the study. And I kept saying, how can we say these are gender pathways if we right. don't in the same study? Um, and then I had a terrible we had a terrible time getting that published. Um, criminology, we said you know, that, that we needed a control group outside. And I mean, and we had amazing findings on the sexual abuse histories of boys. I mean, that, that it was very, it was all right. self-report. Um, and that these were gendered, this stuff happened to girls more, but it was still at epidemic levels for right. what was happening to boys, and given that boys were about 80% of the who's in prisons, and, or who in the youth facilities, that this was really important. So I felt, that felt really important to me. And then um, Emily Garter and I started studying girls who were um, convicted as adults, serving their time, and presented a qualitative study, which was really hard getting the prison to let us have access to that. Uh, but the, again, really, and, and, the, and realizing with a lot of this stuff that Christy and I were doing, and that um, Emily and I were doing, was a lot of these childhood traumas were just things that you would never even think about that could happen to people. And, um, and so, and one of them that was um, our very first focus group that, that um, Christy and I did of incarcerated girls before we did the huge survey was like, witnessing your father. I mean, I, this was another one of those pivotal life points that I'm in Cincinnati. I could, I could literally walk to what was the youth jail there for my house, and I did. My son was, I think, like three and in daycare. And I'm interviewing this young African-American girl, well, a focus group, and this girl who ends up was um, 11, and she was tiny. She was just this really petite person. And um, and when we asked the question, can you pick a time that you think had something to do with you? Um, offending, she, and she just said, yeah, I was um, seven and my dad died. And I'm thinking, oh God, my dad had just died when I was 38, and um, he was shot in the head and by my uncle, and I was the only other one there, and he died with his head in my lap. I, and, and it was just like, I, I thought, how does a seven-year-old brain have processed that? And I'm just and I, I, and I asked, did you get any kind of help or counseling? None. But she said after that, everything went downhill after that. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. But that was where I was like, oh my God, like how many people, their parents have been incarcerated, their Walking parents have away. died. Yeah, and here, and she said, you know, it, it, this my, I'm sad my uncle's in prison for life. You know, the, but her dad died with his head in her lap. So, Part of it was just realizing, oh my God, it's not just sexual abuse and physical abuse and neglect, but which are all horrible collectively and individually, but like these other things that are just so traumatic, such as having your mom be in prison and, right. and these trajectories that, so that felt really important. And then more recently, then I started getting violence against women, about some of the VAWA money to study a lot of different things. Um, a lot of that focus was on women, um, who were whose male partners had been arrested for domestic violence and what was happening in the courts, and then um, and then I did got the scramp with um, Shannon Lynch and um, Dana D. Hart and Bonnie Green to look at um, women's trajectories to jail, but with a focus on women's pathways to jails, but with focusing looking at um, serious mental illness, and that was a whole new thing for me because. All the psych measures before had been simply PTSD and self-esteem. Right. So that was, I had a, this under, whole new understanding there. Well, I mean, I still don't get it, but appreciation, I guess, for serious mental illness and just jails and pre prisons being the biggest holding tanks for mentally right. ill people in the United States, but there's twice as many women in them. Right. So. Well, and as an aside, as you go through and cover your massive career, I'm so jealous, is that um, you didn't mention that Justice Quarterly was your first 
um, as a solo author. I mean, that is freaking amazing. You know, and I was, was lucky with that. Mary Morash, I, I was working, I had gotten an assistantship that was supposed to be my thesis, and I was getting totally screwed on it, on collecting data. And I was, it was down at a, um, the DA's office in Lansing, and there were all these white men that were supposed to be working on it that weren't, but we're gonna be able to use the data. And then when I was going through looking at how they coded it, it was a mess, so I went to Mary and said, I don't know what to do. And she said, do it with me, just wait till you get in the PhD program. But I have a friend with a data set that she's never used. And so, um, that was a political scientist. So I was really lucky, she did great mentoring. Yeah, but I'm lucky. Okay, well thank you. thank you. If you don't do a really good job, you're not hitting JQ as your first article. And it's hardly ever cited that article. <laughs> thank you. Um, the other thing I would like just to say, because I don't think you will, you're too modest, is that, you know, I love, love, love your book. I have loved it from the first day the thing got published. And what I love about it is that it's so comprehensive and if I and so intersectional. And if I need, like, you know, somebody who's doing something esoterical in an area, and I'm thinking there's got to be something on this for women of color or whatever, and I can't find it, You've got it. Mm, thank um, you. So that is freaking amazing. I just love, love, love that. Well, I am excited. The last two editions, the copy editors were terrible and made mistakes in it that I hadn't made as well as not catching some of mine. But the next edition is going to be with Sage, and so I'm really excited. It's going to be much better. So well, it already is bad. Fantastic. Thank you. Was a few times. Um. Oh, Do you want to talk a little bit more specifically about your pathways to feminist criminology and ethnic studies and intersectionality? Because I think that is what you do so well, and you've always been a leader in that. And so, a little bit more how all of that played out. Yeah, I think, so part of it was, um, I was born in Denver, but when I was seven we moved back to Kentucky, the farm that my dad was literally born on. and. I definitely feel like I had a lot of white guilt um, moving back to Kentucky. Just who my family was and, and the history of, I just, um, so, yeah, and the land. And, um, and my sister who was, has been one of my greatest inspirations in my life, and I think she's two and a half years older, but she was always just, I feel like, very aware of racism. And, and my, I mean, my parents were Democrats and stuff. It's not like they were as bad as some people were, but yeah. But my sister was just like constantly pointing stuff out to me around racism, and which I just feel so lucky that I had that. And then I was in this Girl Scout troop because we were in a fairly rural area where I was one of two white girls in the Girl Scout troop, and the, the only other white girl was, um, her mom was um, one of the troop leaders. And it was a really good experience. And this was, like, it was when I was in sixth grade, so I don't know, would that be the 60s or the 70s? Uh, but anyway, it was a time of racial unrest, to put it lightly, 60s. And it was a really hard and good experience. You know, it was like to be, and a lot of times when I would get to the church that it was in, it would just be me and a whole lot of um, African American girls and I was very aware even then, not to the degree I am now, but of privileges I had about being white, but also it was pretty clear I had more money, like different things. So those were really formative lessons. And, um, and it is cool because I'm Facebook friends with some of the, of the women now that were, we were all together. Because I've been trying to find them, some of the ones that I could remember, some of my Girl Scout friends. But anyway, it was just, a, it was a really powerful experience. So I, I always feel like that was really important too. But, um, and then I was always mad about sexism. It always made me mad. And then after the um, attempted rape experience, I just started just being really angry about the way women are treated and violence against women and girls and, and what gender I- Gender politics. And gender politics. And I just, um, I feel like the time I spent in therapy was like really amazing for getting my act together and um, 
And I knew things like, I want to be a professor. I want to change the world. I want to be an activist. I want to be a mom. And, um, and I want to do those, but I certainly, like, I need to do the work I need to get there. So I do, graduate school was, like, really empowering in a lot of ways, but it wasn't just because of the classes and learning and figuring out how to do things. It was. I figured that's the structure. Yeah, that's the structure. Yeah. And I did not, with the exception of Mary, I really didn't fit in with the department well at all. So almost all of my friends either had nothing to do with the university or were in the community psychology and anthropology programs. So, um, and I did have an amazing base of friends, which I, I still do. I really, really just formed some amazing friendships there. And I know, um, because he's an amazing person, that Casey is one of the other great things that you have done along with your partner. So you want to talk about that? Yeah. So and I think there's so many women too who now are trying to juggle stuff, you know, that becomes more and more of a topic. I think our generation, it just was. Yeah. You had no choice so you been kitchen. Well and it's also weird. Well, I had one and you had one amazing. Well I I feel like I mean, I wanted to be a mom my entire life, but I, my mom even would say when I was little, and she never said this to my sister, you know, you have to be married to have children. And um, I was like, well, Pretty sure not true. yeah, I did prove her wrong on that one. Um, but she was, I mean, if, since I was, I loved playing with dolls, all this stuff. And then um, while I was in um, graduate school, I came out as a lesbian. And, um, and I was, it was, like I said, while I was there during my PhD program, and um, and when I got my job at Cincinnati, um, I felt like people, well, um, kept saying things, assuming I was straight before I got there, and this was again way before the internet and everything. So, um, I had this great idea that I should just tell Frank Cullen that I was a lesbian because he was the one I was communicating with the most. And um, so anyway, and so he said, "Can I tell the whole department?" I was like, "Yeah, that's fine." So I, I am pretty sure at Cincinnati that I am the first, I mean there were people, obviously there were LGBTQ queer people there, um, but I'm pretty sure I'm the only person that was out to the entire department when I came up for tenure, and I didn't like I was out before I even got there. And I did a lot with, um, with LGBTQ stuff on campus, I, I was the student advisor for the group, but it was all this stuff. and. Um, and then I was really into that I, as soon as I got tenure, I wanted to have a baby. And, um, and I was having a really hard time figuring out how to do that because even the um, feminist um, OBGYN place would not do artificial insemination if you weren't married. And then, of course, you can only be married to a man. And I, I said to them, so if I could be married to a man who's convicted of raping children and I could get artificially okay. inseminated, but I can't because I'm not married to a man. Oh, I guess so, ha, ha, ha. So anyway, it was, I was driven, but I also was oh, this general. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but I was driven that I was gonna have a baby on my sabbatical, which I was gonna have a baby after I got tenure. Like I felt like I had right. to do that. And I was in a relationship that, um, with a woman and, um, bought a house and everything and I really um, wanted to have this baby. I finally found a doctor that was going to do it. I was really excited and then we had a horrible breakup that I didn't want. It was devastating and you well know because you were my friend at that time and I was devastated and was um, so then I met Scott Summers, my now partner for almost 30 years. Um, and he is the saint. The saint. She's the saint. Yes. He's a saint. He is a saint. Um, many of my lesbian friends call him an honorary lesbian, um, and um, and I met him, and all my friends are like, "Oh my God, you're just doing this because you want to have a baby, and you had a terrible breakup." And uh, and and Scott, I would tell Scott that he's like, "Oh, maybe you are." Ah. But anyway, so we we did it. <laughs> we stayed together. We are monogamous. Um, I love him to death. I just he's been a great. He's been so supportive of all my prison work and a lot of my work on wrongful convictions where we donated money that there's not a lot of money which is not tax deductible into our jail reentry program he and I kept it alive all these years and I think now it's beginning it's going to be okay but so um, anyway we have had this great relationship and then our son Casey is 24 and is just an amazing amazing person and um, and the funniest kid and the funniest kid he's hilarious and I just um, 
like, like sometimes mean people, rude people have said to me, oh, you must be so disappointed you didn't have a daughter. And I'm not at all. I feel like he proves what I've been saying my whole life. That's how we raise people. Right. You know, he's just, he's a wonderfully fun and just generous, kind person. I said all of them, just, can you just I don't know, briefly talk about also how having two cancers and a baby has affected how you've done all this get yeah. past beyond me. So you and I, you and I were both born in 1958 and um, we, you were diagnosed when you were 38 or 39, 39. with breast cancer and it was stage 3B for you, right? And I, and I was still in Cincinnati then and we did not think you were going to live long. It was not looking good at all. And then I, um, and you had been denied tenure in a long case in Eastern Kentucky. It was, um, that was horrible. And you were on the job market and then I left to go, to, that was about the same time you and I left to go, you went to, um, University of Tennessee, Chattanooga, and I went to University of Colorado Boulder about the same time. And then when I was 40, when we were 40, I was diagnosed with melanoma, right after I started my job at melanoma in my leg, which um, they did a horrible job. They kept telling me it wasn't melanoma. Then they, when they took it out, it wasn't all. They made a mess of my leg, um, which I will have problems with. And then three years later, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, so. I, um, I so it definitely, and I, I was just really focused on, Casey was four with the melanoma and seven with the breast cancer, and I just kept thinking I have to, and, and I remember Emily Garter saying one time, and it was right before I was diagnosed with, this, with breast cancer, it's like, oh my God, you do these interviews, and these girls are like, my mom died of breast cancer when I was seven, and then, I, and then you're like, God, no wonder their lives, are. and I'm thinking, oh my God, I am just, you know, this is just gonna be, and I, I was, you know, and a bunch of people said, God, aren't you angry? And I, I said, no, I'm scared. I'm, I, and I'm not, I'm not scared of dying as much as I am of what is this going to do to this kid? And we were really close, and I knew that Scott would, you know, find somebody else. In fact, I had two friends picked out. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, Did they know? Um, yeah, I told them later. Um, I, I, and I told him later, too. But, um, I, I thought they would be perfect. Um, and um, of course, it was be his decision. But um, <laughs> I felt like I had no doubt that he would. He was a great parent. He is a great parent, and that he would pick somebody else who would be a great parent and who would love Casey. But he, Casey would still have to deal with losing yeah, his mother, who he was very close to. And but it was kind of weird because I found work and escape when I could do it when I wasn't feeling too sick and stuff like that. Quite the escape. Yeah, it was. Yeah, but it was funny because I feel like that, that I also thought I'm going to spend a lot of my extra money traveling so that Casey will have these memories. And so we have done some amazing trips, but I also feel like it made me really refreshed when I came back to be able to work. And, um, and, and it also felt important to get these stories out from, especially from women who had these horrific stories I needed to get this stuff published. And, um, yeah, so, but it was, it was healing in a lot of ways. But I, I definitely, I mean, I have so many rejections from so many journals. We were laughing about this morning, even when I was president of, of ASC, I submitted two things that were from massive grants, one with Anda Prince and the other with um, um, Shannon Lynch and Daniel Dehart, and we, we didn't even get a revise and resubmit in either one of them. <laughs> These are like, I think, still amazing studies and papers. So repeat my favorite joke about this. Okay, yeah, so when I, when I gave my presidential speech, I said, I don't think I have it, I put it in the printed version of the activist criminology one, but I said, um, I said, apparently it was much easier for me to be elected president of ASC than it is for me to get published in criminology, which got the biggest right. laugh of my, of my things. Oh, yeah, no, that, that. That was a hard way to get in. <laughs> um, you want to talk about why you're ASC press or? Um, oh yeah. So, well, oh yeah. So this would is be? so funny because so ASC um, decades ago, Mona Danner, Helen, um, Helen, I interviewed you, and Nancy Wonders. We all kind of met through the DWCA and became really good friends. Um, um, bosomless buddies, we might say, because yes. the Mona's also had breast cancer, um, and um, we I, we just really connected, and we've seen each other like through so many things, including your horrible denial of tenure that was so wrong, and um, and us having, three of us having breast cancer, me having melanoma, um, 
the lawsuits and just unbelievable. And so our sisterhood is so powerful. And I, I feel like for ASC, that's the thing that I will always feel like our sisterhood is the most amazing part. And, um, and but you, in addition to Mary, you were my mentors. I, you three were like, and no, you totally were. I, I felt like we would get here and I thought we would talk about our research so much, our teaching so much, our service so much. We gave each other ideas. We made, I mean, I just feel like you were these mentors that were amazing to me. And it was cool because we were all born in 1958. We started calling ourselves the 58 girls. And we, we've gone on amazing trips with each other outside of ASC that we, we are such good friends, um, including this weekend before this, we rented a cabin. And I almost died going up a mountain, but that's the way We almost story. died going up a mountain, and that is a true story in a crazy white man. Yeah, take, take us out for lunch yeah. on the road. <laughs> and that was scary. Um, so, Completely we, scary man with a gun and golf. Scary man with a gun and golf. Like I said, yeah, um, got stuck in front of his house. But, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so it's been one adventure for us after another. And um, I'm just, so one night, and I, I don't even remember how many years ago it was, but it's ten. It ten. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. And Helen, you said, you should there be present at ASC. There may, or I believe there might have been alcohol involved. <laughs> and um, you said, you should be president. And, and Nancy Moan and I burst out laughing. And then, you're like, I'm serious. And so, I don't like, know. I this week. Yeah, she, she wanted the presidential suite. It was all about the president, which was awesome. I mean, ran the piano and stairs, one up, you know, it was awesome. Fruit basket. Um, so, <laughs> I, so anyway, so I did win President ASC, and, um, and nobody was more a big old joke. Yeah, and I, I ne never thought I would win, and I found I, we were actually on vacation in Italy, running with a bunch of our friends at this farmhouse, and I could only get the internet by going up on this roof of the people that owned the farmhouse who weren't there, and I'm like, and and the first thing I see is an email from you that says, "Happy dance, happy dance." <laughs> <laughs> But it was interesting because so many people said, what's more surprising, I, I think I'm the sixth woman that, and since then we've had a lot of women. Okay. But um, so many people said to me, men and women in ASC, said, it is actually more surprising that you're an activist than that you're a woman and you were elected. But right. when I was putting together my materials, Nancy Mona, uh, and you said, don't, no, don't do the activist thing in your statement. Do that after you become president. Do a little. Yeah, a little. So, so, don't, because I was framing it on how we have a responsibility to be trying to change the system and our communities. But anyway, sometimes yeah. you gotta win. Sometimes you gotta win to do that. So sometimes yeah. you gotta have to. Okay. Like, do, I, it, do it, do it, do it. I, I literally said to Lori Prevo last night. She said, are, "She well, she said, are you still glad that you're? Are you glad you were president?" And I think for a second I thought, "Yeah, I am glad," and I'm, I'm still really surprised. What <laughs> was elected? That's the best part of you. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, we may have covered this, but is there a contribution we haven't talked about that you're most proud of? I don't think so. I mean, I think um, publishing with students, mentoring students, publishing with practitioners, I feel like what you said, I feel like I've really tried to make my work intersectional from the get-go. And oh, I've always had a name. Yeah. And I mean, you were doing... I was really trying to, in the first edition of my book, I was just... I was really happy, the women of color that told me that, the criminologists of color told me that they were really happy with what I'd done, so that was really rewarding. Um, and I feel like, like you and Mona and Nancy and I said, when we, our 50th birthday when we were in a cabin, and Mona said, what do you think is going to be our legacy and, from work? And we all agreed it was going to be our undergraduate students, that our graduate students would probably be fine whether we were there or not. But teaching and our, and our undergraduate students and just getting that information out, validating a lot of things that for people. Ball yeah, as the paradigm shifts. That's what I love about it. Yeah, and, and so yeah, I just I think those sort of all things. Oh, and one thing I do do, I'm pretty sure I went, when I was identifying as a lesbian, um, that. I had a round table for lesbian and gay faculty at ASC. I'm trying to remember what year it was, but it probably was um, was 87 or 88 or 89, something around there. But I, when I think about that, and we were like, oh, the people that showed up, I ended up making friends with some people I never would have met. And um, But we were also like, who's walking by to see who's at this table? And I didn't care because I was out, but yeah, it was yeah. just an interesting thing. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, along those lines, um, 
good, I've got it. Um, the other biggest challenges. Um, okay, okay, so cancer, <laughs> cancers were definitely big challenges. That stays one. Um, I feel like and when I was writing my speech for the presidential, my ESC presidential address, and I came across this thing about whistleblowers, and it wasn't even that I was writing about, I don't even remember how I came across it, but I remember emailing it to, and then I put it in my speech, but emailing it to you and Mona and Nancy about most whistleblowers don't realize they're whistleblowers because they think that everybody's going to be appalled when they find out what happened. <laughs> it's like, oh no, they're not, they come after you, like really mean. So, um, so I had, so, I've, I've had these things that really just negatively affected me. And one, the first one was, it was um, a student called me, and um, this was about, I think, 1990 um, or 91, in, um, when I was at Cincinnati, and called me, and she, I hadn't unlisted phone numbers before cell phones, and um, I found out later she called the chair of my department crying and said, can you please give me Joanne's number? <laughs> Yeah, and he did. And so the long and short of it was that she reported being raped by, she had been raped a couple of days earlier by one of the star basketball, men's Cincinnati. basketball players in Cincinnati. And so I talked to her and said, did you, did you go to the hospital? Did you go to the police? And her roommates were out of town. And I, so I said, let me come over and just, and so I said, do you want me to drive you to the hospital? And she said she did. So we went there, and that was a horrific experience. The hospital was awful. And then the police, when they came, the first question they asked was whether she was a virgin. And I know it was one horrible. And then four other vic three or four other victims came forward, all of whom didn't know each other. And it ended up being the first cable court cable TV show. So um, that they they videotaped a court case, and I was sequestered with all of the rape survivor, all the um, rape victims in this case, they tried all of them at the same time. I started out the, um, at the beginning of it, they were trying to, and I was never allowed in there and they never had me testify and the DA did a horrible job. He actually told us halfway through, he thought it'd be worse to be conked on the back of the head than to be date raped. And um, so anyway, it was in the news quite a bit. And um, one of the people in the department w w testified on behalf of the um, the defendant, and it was just oh my god, it was just a really really hard hard thing. And then I, it was in like I said, it was in the news. And then I felt like people were making fun of the victims and me on campus, and, and like celebrate. And it was just, and I just had had it, and um, and how I'd been portrayed in the trial. I felt like was so I started out as being the lesbian lecherous professor and at the um, and then at the end the main victim was that she was trying to and I was jealous of you know it was just like all this crazy stuff and um, I was really depressed and it made me think I'm, it was I had just gotten tenure and I was also like I just gotten that was in that the relationship had ended that I was talking about and I'm just really depressed and so when I went to ASU we had a DWC meeting in 1991 I believe in San Francisco and I ended up just telling this story and I couldn't stop crying. But we all, every, then what happened was a bunch of women started talking about being victimized at ASC meetings. By our fellow colleagues. By our fellow Some colleagues. Some of them well known, very well, with lots of access. Lots of access. A lot of times it was as graduate students, but not always. And, um, but then we just, we all started, it was unbelievable. Um, everybody that was there was like, oh my God. And so that, um, and I, but I, again, I feel like that kept me in academia because I had the support. And that was actually, I think, when we all, you and Nancy and Nana and I really, really solidified our friendship there. Well, also, I mean, the rest of the story is that after that meeting, then we got, once the president, somebody gave us the suite to continue the conversation. And there had to have been 50 people yeah. there and naming names. Yeah. Um, I don't know yeah, we went anywhere after that, but yeah. there was no anonymous yeah. perps in that room. No, and, um, and the stories, um, a lot of them, were, again, were what were, were sexual abuse, rapes that happened at, at ASC meetings, and um, or in while we were in graduate school or different mm -hmm. things, and it was really powerful. Um, I'll never forget what what shook me to my core from that meeting. I never expected my colleagues to be raping people at the conference. I know. Um, 
hopefully it's yeah I, I mean it, and there was there was so many men then it was there, it was so white yeah, and so male there were just true. not that many it's so different now that's true I mean I hope that sexual abuse is really different too um, and I like to think it is because we're not I mean some stuff but nothing right as awful as those but um so yeah so that happened and um and then um when I was at Cincinnati the thing with the football rapes, which I felt like the university was responsible. They ended up finding, I'm actually I'm really good friends now with the, the woman who, she's a former sex worker, she actually came and talked to my class this semester, who'd been hired by the football team to come and bring all these women to pretend to be undergraduate students for these recruits. Right. So we're 17 year old men. Right. So I feel like they, they were implicated in, in encouraging young men to rape. Fortunately, that process, even though people are saying it's gone, is not gone. Yeah. Um, I think you're mostly using legit cheerleaders now, but mm -hmm. I mean, they're still using them as fake. Yep. And, and um, so I kept saying the page should be fired. I got all, all, all this grief for that. And, um, and, 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 and like, people thought I liked being in the media, which I really do not. And um, so they're all these years, but I kept saying, and everybody kept saying, why you? And I said, I don't know why other, nobody else in women and gender studies is doing this. I don't know why the feminist lawyers in the law school aren't speaking out. I wish they would. And my partner kept saying, oh my God, can't somebody, because it was right after I had breast cancer, can't somebody else do this? And I said, they're not. And I just, so yeah, so that happened. Most recently. And then, then um, at my infamous year as chair of the sociology department, um, I had students coming to complain as soon as I was chair about Patty Adler's prostitution slash horse, yeah, I hate that word, um, that she did, and then it was very triggering for victims that were just watching it, not to mention the people that were actually in the skit. Having students be in the middle. Yeah, and so the students were, the, was, sometimes it was graduate student TAs and sometimes it was undergraduate TAs who had no syllabus, which is a violation of university policy, it was taped without their consent and sold without their consent. And um, and which she claimed she didn't know that you had to have consent for this. And um, so people start coming and reporting and so I reported it on up and then um, I allowed the, um, I kept saying, and she kept saying anybody was allowed to be in the class. And I said, so you could have people, again, my line, you could have people that are convicted, rapists, whatever, the room, 500 student room, and anybody, so, and she said, people fly in for this. So um, the thing that made a lot of people mad at me was that I allowed the, uh, what was then the Office of Discrimination and Harassment to go in and watch it. And, um, but I felt like it was open to anybody, but that was one of the things, and I still stand by that. I'm, I'm sorry, if you say your class is open to anybody and you're doing something that has been reported, I mean, but anyway. So, and then she made the tape, and then we did get a copy of the tape. Um, and it is offensive on so many levels. But it's like, um, um, who wants to, who's the lowest of the whores? And the students are yelling out, crack whores, and it's like, no, it's slave whores. And, that's how it starts. Which is not coming. an academic term. Yeah, and not an academic term. And walking down, and, and it was making fun of violence against women. It was racist characters of victims, of prostitutes, perps. of pimps, of perps, of gay, um, uh, gay, gay men hookers, and I mean, just it was appalling. But anyway, I still stand by what I did. What I didn't realize was that all these faculty had had it reported to them and hadn't reported it on up. So that was when they all came, when they kept having these no confidence folks in me. At first I was like, what? aren't they appalled by this? But then I realized that most of them knew about it and hadn't reported and hadn't done anything. And so that's why they all started um, defending her. And then they said that I'd ruined the department. No, none of our graduate students would get jobs. Blah, blah, blah. I've had enough you had all the internal backlash. Yeah. But then the external. Yeah, and then the external backlash. Um, AS American Sociological Association, Triple SP, ACLU, AAUP, and I've been on the board of AAUP at Cincinnati. Did any of them ever even contact you? Mm -mm. And they, um, they all wrote these things about that I was against uh, academic freedom and um, and faculty governance and um, and I, 
and I wasn't allowed to speak because I was chair. Well, there, some of the stuff they were releasing was completely fictitious. And I'm still, even at this conference, I have found out things that happened that I didn't know happened. And, um, and I and knew victims that I, um, different things, and it's just like, wow. And what happened now most recently, Amy Wilkins, another professor that has been in the news about um, being charged with um, sexually exploiting students. And they had had, they said when they watched me and had this climate survey of the department, they were afraid to report harassment and nothing was done about it. And so um, I'm really happy to be in ethnic studies for so many reasons. It's definitely the best intellectual and compassionate fit for me, but it's also, I love being in a department that values undergraduate teaching. That has been so great for me because I just, I love graduate teaching, but I have to say I love undergraduate teaching more and I think it's so important and it's just great to be around other people that think it's really important too and it's really the first time in my career that I've been in a department where the vast majority really think what are, and they think our research is important too and they also love that I do all the service in the prison class. Right. Would you have done anything different? Um, the only thing that I feel like I would have done differently is I just, I just wish, I mean the whole thing with the Adler case was extremely painful because these were people I thought were my friends, some of them. People I had to my house for parties that had nothing to do with work. People I had hired, I'd been on their tenure committees, their promotion to full committees, had baby showers for. Um, I wish, like, I, I, I mean, the only things that I did wrong according to the university policy were things that the deans had told me to do that I didn't realize. In my, the, the Boulder Faculty Assembly, all the people said I shouldn't have let the ODH into the class. I just wish I hadn't thought to trust, I mean, I, I like, I just wish I had known I shouldn't trust my colleagues, that they were going to throw me under the bus. Don't and that, no, and even people that, some of the people that I realized had had it reported to them that definitely knew, I mean, we were all trained that you were supposed to report this one up. Um, I wish that one of the victims, the only one that they know reported it, who then was treated really badly. Um, I just wish that all of that hadn't happened. And it played out differently. It played out differently. Because you did the right thing. I did the right thing. And I, you know, at the, I, the time I just kept thinking I would do the same thing all over again. I just wish I'd known that I couldn't trust the faculty. And the dean, maybe? And the deans, yeah. The dean and the associate dean. So the time. Yeah, that's the way it goes. Yeah. And actually, I'm higher up. I won't complain more later. Nothing ever happened. Um, I think we're getting almost everything that we might want to talk about. But um, how do you think ASC has most changed in 30 plus years? I, I, um, I, I do. I love, I mean, mostly it's gender and race. Right. I mean, it just, it was, I remember one time getting here when I my, was a brand new assistant professor, so it was probably 86, and, and saying, running into Mita and said, oh my God, we're on the planet of the white guys. Like just, it was, it was like, yeah. it was such a white male organization. And I mean, you and I would go and sometimes we, we'd go to some panels that would be all white guys to talk about how to get a job, and, just, and we had jobs, and actually right. we would be hiring most of the time just to like put in our points. <laughs> all be sexually grounded here. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so I just, to me, that is just, just thrilling. I mean, and I, I definitely, a, a system that is as raced and racist as our criminal legal system is, it is ridiculous to have it. Just predominantly white people. And I, I am, that to me, that is so exciting. Just there's so many more women and there's so many more people of color doing this work and doing just kick-ass work. I think the qualitative ethnographies have gotten um, way more validity than they used to, or recognition than they used to. Um, so I think that's just, that's been huge. And just the intersectional criminology has just been really, really necessary, important, and it's happening. And, um, and so that, I think there's just a lot of really, really exciting if you had a magic wand, is there one thing you would want us to become? Um, I, I, I would like to figure out a way for ASC to do more for convict criminologists. 
Um, and I'd also like to weigh in more on policies and the times I've been on the board, a lot of times we've been, I tried to have stuff that hasn't worked, but you know, we have had voting against the, um, the death penalty and other stuff. I think we should, I mean the AMA and the places like that do that. I just, I tried years ago when I was on the board when Jan Brewer was first doing those laws, the uh, anti-immigration ones in, um, in Arizona to come out. I couldn't even get anybody to second it on the board um, as well as an yeah, executive I council. Was here in Atlanta, so it was probably about 10 years ago. Yeah. I remember Rosemary asking Jimmy Carter, should we be involved with policy? And he looked at like, and he was talking to people from another planet. Yeah. Like, yeah, duh. <laughs> it's kind of like, what good are you if, you if we're not doing policy? Yeah, so I would definitely like to see that. And um, and I, 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 I think there is some on teaching. I always think there should be more on teaching. It's just such an important part of what we do. But I'm excited. Yay. Yeah. Is there anything we haven't discussed? I don't think so. I just want to say you have been one of my very best friends in the whole world. Love you. I love you. And I, I feel like I can't imagine anybody I would have rather have interview me. Okay, stop. We're crying. Okay. <laughs> that might be the only time you've had that. <laughs> and she's my bestie. Thank you, Brian. That, that was fantastic. Oh, she's amazing, isn't she? Yeah. <laughs>